Hi class, this lecture is on the developmental perspective of psychopathology and at this point most of you should have taken a developmental psychology course. So a lot of this is kind of review. This, this chapter just kind of uh, uh, highlights developmental psychology and uh, just kind of gives you a brief introduction of how it's related to psychopathology. But if you want to think about it in a different way, uh, what I want you to conceptualize is why do things go wrong in a child? Why do things go right as well? Um, if you remember back to your developmental psychology course, you probably learned about the Freudian psychosexual stages. Stages of development are very important. You probably also learned about Eric Erickson's stages of development uh, and other theorists. So remember that behavior progresses in an order, not necessarily that Freud is right or Erickson is right, but we know that behavior develops uh, stage-wise. So whether you want to think about this from like a Freudian perspective as far as developmental stages, uh, if you conceptualize it in a different way, like the behaviorist, like this is B.F. Skinner, he would say, no, you know, like, the, I don't really believe in the development of stages. Uh, behavior is learned through interaction with the environment. Or Maslow would say, no, 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 wait, you guys are wrong. You need to have certain things in place uh, before you can reach the next level of development. So if you remember, in the field of psychology, we have a number of different perspectives. Each perspective is going to take a different approach to conceptualizing psychopathology. So if you get an evolutionary psychologist and a psychodynamic psychologist in the room, they're probably going to disagree about the etiology or the cause of a particular disorder. So what I want you to remember, though, is in, in, uh, we're going back to general psychology or introduction to psychology. Remember the source of information, and, and this is very important to me, uh, particularly some psychologists don't think this is quite as important, but psychology is a science. And as such, we should be using the scientific method. When we have questions that we want to answer, we don't want to base it on our opinions. So remember, our opinions are biased. But if we follow the scientific method, we make observations and ask questions. We do background research. If we're doing a study, we would construct a hypothesis and then design an experiment to test that hypothesis, analyze data, and then uh, draw conclusions based on the data that we analyze and we'll either uh, support or reject our hypothesis. And then, we would revise the hypothesis and this um, sets up a perpetual uh, wheel of scientific research. And the whole point of using the scientific method is to reduce error and gather information in a way that is objective versus subjective. Now, if you just tell me your opinions or what you think, based on an observation or question, that is subjective. That's your opinion. And it's biased. You might be right, but you might be wrong also. So in this field, um, when we're looking at child psychopathology, you're going to notice that a lot of people are biased. They just use their own experiences to tell you why a child is or is not acting in a particular way. And that's not good enough for me. I want empirical evidence. And that's why, you know, your professors stress that you use academic sources from peer-reviewed journals because we know that that information has followed the scientific method and gathered information in a way that is objective. And it's hopefully reliable. Um, so. Uh, that's very important. So in this class and all your other classes in the social sciences, make sure you're getting good source material. 
Don't just make so stuff up on your own. So if we look at the different uh, conceptualizations of why children develop different disorders, there's, there's uh, bigger categories of ways to think about this. One is interactional. And uh, when we talk about the interactional method, we talk about the diathesis stress model. Uh, your book calls it the vulnerability uh, stress model. Um, most often you'll hear of it as a diathesis stress model. And now I've seen some stuff in the literature calling it the ORCID hypothesis, that people have a predisposition to developing a disorder, whether that's a genetic predisposition or maybe like a, I don't know, a structural abnormality or something like that. Usually it's genetic though. Think of this as a genetic predisposition. And then you have to have things in the environment that bring out that disorder. And those things in the environment are stressors. So you have a genetic predisposition and then you have to have sufficient stressors in order to see the manifestation of the disorder. That's a good model to follow. I like uh, that model. Um, there's good research evidence to support that. Usually students say, well, wait a second, I thought it was nature or nurture. Uh, one of those is gonna be driving pathology. And no, it's not. It's always a little bit of both. Uh, so remember, it's always nature via nurture. And that's what the diathesis stress model is. There's other ways of looking at uh, psychopathology, like the trans transactional um, perspective looks at development um, and says that it occurs due to transactions between individuals and their environment. So this would be more like the behaviorist, like Skinner. So it depends on what happens to you. It's transactional. Or people will approach um, psychopathology in children from the systems perspective. So the, in the systems perspective, development occurs over time as systems interact. So all of us are part of multiple systems, like our family. So how does development occur within that system? So we can also look at direct causes versus indirect causes of psychopathology. A direct cause would be the, uh, something, a variable, like variable X, leads straight to outcome Y. One yields the other. An indirect would be that X influences other variables that in turn lead to outcome Y. So, I mean, think back to like your research design classes. Um, that would be like confounding variables. So something else gets in the way. Let's look at this. So here, you can see these are chromosomes and down here you'll see that there's three chromosomes there at 21 that is trisomy 21 what does that cause well hopefully you know the answer and that would be down syndrome but is that a direct cause or an indirect cause and think about that that's a good question that could be on a midterm or final well that would be a direct cause it causes it directly there's also mediating factors and moderating factors mediating factors explain the relationship between different variables whereas moderating factors it's the presence or absence of a factor that influences the relationship between variables so what about this alcoholism and behavioral problems in kids. So uh, what do you think there? Would that be mediating or moderating? Well, I want you to think about all the other things that might come along um, with problems related to alcohol use. Um, that individual might have poor parenting skills, there might be marital difficulties, 
And that might be uh, the better explanation uh, for difficulty in the relationship between the parent and the child when alcohol problems are present. So that would be a mediating factor. How about gender, culture, or socioeconomic status? Those would be examples of moderating factors. So we also look at uh, things that uh, may um, cause a disorder. If something must be present for the disorder to occur, we call that a necessary cause. Sufficient uh, can be responsible alone. Uh, and contributing means that it's not always necessary, but sufficient for cause. Okay, so when we look at um, psychopathology in children, oftentimes we're able to identify risk factors that are associated with developing specific problems. And risk factors kind of have a tendency to cluster together. So usually you see uh, a bunch of risk factors uh, compounded in a specific disorder. So, you know, we talk about hereditary influences like gene abnormalities, prenatal complications, uh, low IQ or learning difficulties, um, psychological and social risk factors, poor parenting, uh, poverty, uh, difficulty in the neighborhood. Uh, racial, ethnic, or gender injustice, and non-normative stressful events. The opposite of risk factors are protective factors. And sometimes protective factors are called resilience. And um, even though child might have one or numerous risk factors, a lot of times there is a positive outcome in the face of risk and I want you to keep that in mind so just because somebody has four or five risk factors doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to have problems in the future that individual might be very resilient so examples of protective factors would be like problem-solving skills skills and self-regulation, positive views of self, achievement motivation, perceived self-efficacy and control, active coping strategies, close caring family relationships, supportive relationships with uh, other adults, friends or romantic partners, spirituality or finding meaning in life. So um, some of the historical figures in this area that have looked at uh, other factors. Uh, one would be John Bowlby um, and his uh, work on attachment. I'll, I mean, you should know who Bowlby is. If you don't, uh, you should probably Google him. Um, and he his work was done with infants looking at how they attach to caregivers in their environment, whether they have insecure or uh, secure attachment to their uh, caregivers. His work is very similar to Mary Ainsworth. Mary Ainsworth developed the stranger situation test where you take a child um, with their parents and then have them in the room with a researcher and then uh, the parent will get up and leave the room. What does a child do at that point in time? Now, there's different attachment patterns that Mary Ainsworth identified, including secure, insecure, resistant, avoidant, and disorganized attachment. So there's a video in your Moodle class that you can watch um, that kind of recreate the strange situation um, test. Temperament is kind of interesting. So... Uh, temperament. Um, when a child is born, um, 
sometimes parents will describe a child as being very easygoing. You know, they'll say, oh, my first child, they just slept all the time. You know, when they were awake, they liked to eat, and they were such a joy. But other children are really difficult, um, and they require a lot of attention. Often they cry uh, a lot. They're fussy. They're picky. Um, it's difficult to expose them to new situations. What is the difference between those two children? Well, temperament is like personality in adults. We can see personality differences. This is in um, children. So there's different categories of behavior that's related to temperament, like negative reactivity, inhibition, and self-regulation. And when um, I think about temperament, I always bring up the example of a baby with colic, or sometimes parents will say a colicky baby. Um, the other day, someone uh, um, related to me, this was like something clinical about a child that was recently diagnosed as being colic. And I said, well, wait a second, you know, who diagnosed a child with colic? And the parents assumed that it was some sort of disorder. Um, I think they thought it was like a gastrointestinal disorder. And a lot of people believe that, um, especially in Wyoming. Here, a lot of people have horses, and horses will get colic. Um, that's uh, intestinal disorder, which can be fatal in the horse. Dogs can get colic. Same thing. Oftentimes, it's fatal in animals. In humans, though, colic means temperament, and colic is a cranky baby. So it's uh, very different from the way that a lot of people conceptualize it. When, um, when I was young, I don't know if my parents had to do this with me or not. I'll, I'll have to ask my mother, but um, what parents did when they had a baby that had colic, the doctor would tell them to run the vacuum cleaner in the child's bedroom. And it was this miracle cure for colic. Well, what was that? What was really going on? The reality is that the vacuum cleaner made a bunch of noise and it drowned out the crying sounds of the baby so the parents could get some sleep. It had nothing to do with the treatment at all. And it was just covering up the temperament of a cranky child. So there's also emotional responses that children learn um, and emotion develops over time. Um, there's three elements of emotion. One is kind of your internal cognitive emotional response. So like your feelings of joy or sadness but then you also have a physical response, uh, and that would be your autonomic nervous system um, reacting. So that's uh, arousal, um, so increased heart rate, uh, respiration, sweating, that type of stuff. And then you have overt behavioral expressions that you would see on somebody's face. So sometimes we call those like nonverbal responses whether somebody's smiling or scowling or, you know, maybe their posture is drooped, something like that. And emotional regulation uh, becomes important. I mean, that is a, a key thing that children have to learn. And they have to learn positive and negative adjustment. And parents play a very important role in facilitating, facilitating the development of emotional regulation. And this is crucial to adaptive and competent development in a child. Um, and it's a stepwise process where you have to learn emotional regulation. So that's it for this lecture. It's a short one. Uh, this chapter kind of gives you just a brief introduction to this. Um, I think it's important and that's why we have uh, like a developmental course as a typical prerequisite for a course like this so you kind of understand those stages of development. If you need to review a little bit, there's plenty of material to review. Um, you can go search that out on your own. Um, 
So that's it for this lecture.